Right. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for coming along tonight, uh, particularly as the sun's shining and it's such a lovely evening out there. Um, if I had pre-planned this a bit better, I wouldn't have clashed with the opening of the World Cup either, but there we have it. Um, my name is John Mackay. I'm an associate tutor at the Centre of uh, Lifelong Learning here. And I thought before I got started, I should just tell you a little bit about me. Uh, my PhD, which I finished a couple of years ago, um, is primarily on Scottish writing and dialect. And at the moment, I'm working on a research project which um, involves James Kelman and his portrayal of women. Now, you might think that there's not much of a link to Wolf, but there kind of is. Um, my work in Wolf does, in part, come out of it. Um, Kelman has adapted, or at least I believe he's adapted, uh, Wolf's narrative technique for his own means. And it's also essential that I have a thorough understanding of feminist theory and criticism to be able to pull off what I'm trying to pull off. Uh, I have also taught Wolf and modernism to undergraduates at the University of Lincoln as well. So um, I guess I'm just trying to justify why I'm here. Um, that's me. So now I'm going to talk about Virginia and uh, we'll take it from there. Jane Goldman's 2006 book, the Cambridge Introduction to Virginia Woolf opens with the following statement. Reading Virginia Woolf will change your life, may even save it. Now, I can't guarantee that my lecture today will change your life, and I doubt very much that it will save it. However, what I hope to do is convey a sense of how Woolf fits into the larger whole that is literary modernism, and how her work uh, has a place and relevance in the 21st century. I'd like to take the fear out of reading Wolf, if you like. It's also my intention to offer a snapshot of the courses um, that I'm leading over the next academic year here at the Centre of Lifelong Learning. From October, I'm running a 10-week course titled Introduction to Modernism, and in January there will be another course which is on Virginia Woolf, uh, both of which build upon some of the concepts that I'm trying to develop here. The original idea for this lecture came about as a result of a conversation that I had with a volunteer in my shop. Um, I should actually point out um, one of the other things that I do is I manage Oxfam Books on Low Petergate in town. Now, we had a donation of uh, books that had come in, and we're just looking through them. Um, and there was two a lighthouse, sorry, two the lighthouse even, and Mrs. Dalloway. I suggested it might struggle to sell those two particular works as I feel there's a general perception that Wolf is a difficult read. Quite rightly, the volunteer asked me to justify this generalisation, um, and I imagine she didn't expect me to write a, re a lecture as a response. In order to write this, I've, I've made a couple of assumptions. Um, firstly, that either you've read or you're interested in reading some Wolf. And as such, um, I've split the lecture into some main themes that I'll discuss in relation to um, well, three key texts really, <coughs> which is her, her diaries, the novel Mrs. Dalloway, and the extended essay A Room of One's Own. So the breakdown of the lecture is up there for you. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a brief biography. Um, I'll talk about modernism and Wolf and Elliot and Joyce. I also want to talk about Wolf as being a narrative experimentalist. I want to talk a little about beginnings and also a little bit about feminism. And then finally I'll end with who is afraid of Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf was born on the 25th of January 1882 and died the 28th of March 1941. She was the daughter of Leslie Stephen, a Victorian man of, a Victorian man of letters best known as the founder of the Dictionary of National Biography. While her mother, Julia Stephen, was associated with a number of prominent pre raphaelite painters, Wolfe was therefore born into the intellectual aristocracy, and through her relationship with her father, she was exposed to an excellent education unusual for a woman of this period. What most people know about Wolfe is that her life was troubled by periods of mental instability, which included suicide attempts and depression. Following her father's death in 1904, she suffered a breakdown, during which she heard the birds singing in Greek, and incidentally, in, in Mrs. Dalloway, the character of Septimus, uh, he, he also hears the, spa, uh, the sparrows singing in Greek. The family moved to Bloomsbury in London around this time. Through her brother Toby, who was at Cambridge, Wolfe established important friendships made with many leading artists. 
writers, intellectuals and philosophers, whom she entertained at her Bloomsbury home along with her sister, the artist Vanessa Bell. In 1912, Virginia married Leonard Woolf, whom she met through this circle. The couple bought a printing press in 1917, partly as a distraction for Virginia, and the Hogarth Press was born. It was responsible for some of the most advanced writing of the day, including works by T.S. Eliot, Catherine Mansfield and the Wolves themselves. Eliot's The Wasteland and Mansfield's Pre Prelude were both published by Hogarth. They also considered but finally refused to publish James Joyce's Ulysses, apparently because of its length, but also perhaps because it would have been hard to find a printer who would risk the prosecution for obscenity. From around 1919, Will's career as a novelist began in earnest. She published Night and Day in 1919, Jacob's Room in 1922, and she finished writing Mrs. Dalloway in 1924 before publishing it in 1925, when she was also working on To the Lighthouse, published in 1927. And her extended essay, A Room of One's Own, was published in 1929. In 1941, she drowned herself during a period of illness while the couple were living in Sussex to escape the London bombings. By the time of her death, Virginia Woolf had produced nine novels, nearly 4,000 letters, about 400 essays and 30 volumes of her diaries. So why are we afraid of Virginia Woolf? In order to answer this question, I'll first attempt to outline literary modernism. This itself is a bit of a challenge and it's probably easier to clarify what it's not. <coughs> it's not a current school or movement. There are no definitive dates or period for literary modernism. It's usually early 20th century, loosely after the end of the First World War and before the start of World War II. But of course there are texts that can be described as modernist that fall outside this time frame. And here I'm particularly thinking of um, the work of Samuel Beckett and Anton Chekhov. 1922 is often held up as a sort of year zero for modernism, largely as it's the year of publication for Eliot's Wasteland, James Joyce's Ulysses, and to a lesser extent, Wolfe's Jacob's Room. It'd be fair at this point to ask, what is it that makes a text modernist? Well, there are a number of shared characteristics that can be frequently identified in a modernist text, such as poetic language, regardless whether the text is a poem, uh, prose, or even drama. Open-endedness, Modernist texts often lack a definitive ending and sometimes, sometimes lack a definitive beginning. They're experimental and there's usually a sense of breaking away from the established rules. And naturally, to make the defin definitions even more problematic, a modernist text may have some of these traits, but not necessarily all of them. Is it any wonder readers are afraid of reading Virginia Woolf? <coughs> the general time span of modernism between the wars was a time of great change and often the literature of this period re reflects and responds to this. Among the factors that influenced modernism was the rapid growth of, of modern in industrial society and the city, followed then by the horror of the First World War and the suffragette movement. The activities of daily life were becoming outdated in the new economic, social and political environment of the emerging industrial world. Modernist writers began to think of themselves and their world in a different way, and I think to an extent this this is reflected in the experimental nature of the work. The writing of this period reflects and reacts to the changes happening around them, and although there is no case of school as such, there is a lot of contact between some of the writers and much interplay between their texts. One very obvious example of this is in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which is dedicated for Ezra Pound, Il Miglio Fabro. This means the better craftsman, and it's a direct quote from Dante who in turn is acknowledging uh, the Italian troubadour, Arnold Daniel. Pound helped Eliot to edit his text, and in this three-word dedication, Eliot is able to signal the intertextual nature of the poem that follows. So once you have a poem that acknowledges its debt to a literary tradition, Dante, who is also recognising his own debt to a tradition, and its debt to its peers, Pound, while fashioning something that is entirely new. Virginia Woolf was friends with her contemporaries T.S. Eliot and Catherine Mansfield. They would read, critique and review each other's work. And indeed, the opinions of her peers seemed to shape her own with regard to literature. To illustrate this, I'll quote from her diaries. And I, I think that Woolf's diaries stand up alongside her fiction as central text for modernism and demonstrate how its themes were, were developed. <coughs> so this is uh, Wednesday, August the 16th, 1922. 
I should be reading Ulysses and fabricating my, ca my case for, against. I've read 200 pages so far, not a third. And I've been amused, stimulated, charmed, interested by the first two or three chapters to the end of the cemetery scene, and then puzzled, bored, irritated, and disillusioned by a queasy undergraduate scratching his pimples. And Tom, great Tom, thinks this on par with war and peace. An illiterate, underbred book, it seems to me. The book of a self-taught working man. And we all know how distressing they are. How egotistic, insist insistent, raw, striking, and ultimately nauseating. When one can have the cooked flesh, why have the raw? But I think if you're anemic, as Tom is, there is glory in blood. Being fairly normal myself, I am soon ready for the classics again. I may revise this later. I do not compromise my critical sagacity. I, place, I plant a stick in the ground to march, mark page 200. In this passage, Tom refers to Eliot. And Wolf seems troubled that her friend rates Ulysses so highly. Her objections to Joyce seem to be founded upon his class and her reading of class into the work. But tellingly, she does say that she may revise her opinion later. After all, this is an initial view from, from Wolfe upon reading the first book publication of Ulysses by Joyce in 1922. What strikes me about this passage is that, although it is from 1922, and given the chronology of the publication of Ulysses, uh, Wolfe must have already seen it. Uh, her own Hogarth Press turned down the opportunity to publish it in 1918, and large parts of it had already been published in journal form. It seems a little odd that Wolfe would only have read the first third of the novel at this point. However, upon saying that, I'm sure she's not the only reader who has planted a stick in the ground to mark page 200. <coughs> a month later, she's still discussing Ulysses with, with Elliot. Thursday, September the 26th, 1922. Tom said, he is purely a literary writer. He is founded upon Walter, Walter Pater with a dash of Newman. I said he was Vera, a he-goat. Didn't expect Tom to agree. Tom did, though. And he said he left out many things that were important. The book would be a landmark because it destroyed the whole of the 19th century. It left Joyce himself with nothing to write another book on. It showed up the futility of all the English styles. Now, my point is that through a dialogue with Eliot, her opinion of Ulysses is gradually shifting, possibly more towards that of, of Eliot. I think her view of Joyce, the man, remains largely the same. And similarly, in, in the next extract from 1942, Wolfe is reflecting upon Joyce's death and she recounts an anecdote involving Ulysses and Catherine Mansfield. So this is Wednesday, January the 14th, 1941. I put it in the drawer of the inlaid cabinet. One day Catherine Mansfield came and I had it out. She began to read, ridiculing, then suddenly said, but there's something in this. I seen that I, that should figure, I suppose, in the history of literature. And I guess by my quoting of this passage, the, the scene she describes has indeed entered the history of lit literature, but it also gives a fascinating insight into her relationship with Mansfield. It's easy to imagine Mansfield mocking Ulysses and then stopping herself by asserting there's something in this. By the time we get to 1925 and the publication of The Common Reader, which is a collection of essays and articles on literature and reading, Wolfe's view of Joyce has become uh, uh, as follows. It is, at any rate, in some, some such fashion as this that we seek to define the quality which distinguishes the work of several young writers, among whom Mr James Joyce is the most notable, from that of their predecessors. The attempt to come closer to life and to preserve more sincerely and exactly what interests and moves them. Even if to do so, they must discard most of the conventions which are commonly observed by the novelist. Let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance, which each sight or instant scores upon the consciousness. Let us not take it for granted that life exists more fully in what is commonly thought big than of what is commonly thought small. Anyone who has read the portrait of the artist as young man, or what promised to be far more inter interesting work, Ulysses, now appearing in the Little Review, will have hazarded some theory of this nature as to Mr Joyce's intention. On our part, with such a fragment before us, it is hazarded rather than affir affirmed. But whatever the intention of the whole, there can be no question but that it, it is of the most utmost sincerity 
and that the result, difficult or unpleasant as we may judge it, is undeniably important. Now this is taken from a revised essay uh, titled Modern Fiction. The original essay was called Modern Novelists and was published in the Times Literary Supplement in 1919, which possibly explains why the word fragment appears, since, of course, Ulysses was published three years after the original article. The first thing to note about this passage is that each time Joyce is mentioned, he is referred to as Mr. And this is something that is done throughout the essay with every author, giving us Mr. Wells, Mr. Goldsworthy, Mr. Conrad, and Mr. Bennett. Now, you could read this as both being very formal, However, I believe that she's making a subtle point about the gender of the writers, and I'll consider this more fully later. But for now, if I can draw your attention to the follow part, following part of the above extract. <coughs> they attempt to come closer to life and to preserve more sincerely and exactly what interests and moves them. Even if to do so, they must discard most of the conventions which are commonly observed by the novelist. Let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance, which each sight or instant scores upon the consciousness. Now, although this is written about Joyce, it could easily have been written about Wolfe's own work. I think this passage demonstrates what Wolfe's fiction was setting out to achieve, and it's only after the publication in, of, of Ulysses in 1922 that it can be realised. <coughs> Indeed, I'm confident that there's no coincidence that both Ulysses and Mrs. Dalloway take place over a single day. Actually, in fact, Mrs. Dalloway takes place on Wednesday the 13th, June, sorry, Wednesday the 13th of June 1923. So I, I guess I should probably have been giving this lecture tomorrow night instead. But, um, according to the critic Elizabeth Abel, Wolfe superimposes the outlines of multiple familiar yet altered plots that dispel the constraints of a unitary plan, diffuse the chronological framework of the single day, and um, enable an iconoclastic poet plot to weave its course covertly through the narrative grid. In some respects it's possible to see Mrs. Dalloway as Wolfe's response to Ulysses. Although the time frame of the novel occurs over this single day, Wolfe's novel contains several flashbacks from Clarissa, giving a complex narrative that switch back, switches back and forth between actual time and previous events that allows the reader to build upon a fuller understanding of its protagonist. Abel sees this as an expansion of a Jane Austen romance. Wolfe's treatment of the romantic plot in Mrs. Dalloway reveals the temporal boundaries of Austen's narratives, which cover primarily the courtship and happy marriages. Wolfe condenses the expanded moment that constitutes an Austen novel and locates it in a remembered scene 30 years prior to the present of our narrative. So if, if Mrs. Dalloway were an Austen novel, it would focus on the happy courtship that occurred between Clarissa and Peter 30 years before Wolfe's novel takes place. We would not have the fe fleeting glimpses of their past relationship. Do you know who's in town? said Lady Brutton, suddenly be bethinking her. Our old friend, Peter Walsh. They all smiled. Peter Walsh? And Mr. Dalloway was genuinely glad. Millie Brush, though, thought, and Mr. White, Whitebread thought only of his chicken. Peter Walsh, all three, Lady Brutton, Hugh Whitbread and Richard Dalloway, remembered the same thing. How passionately Peter had been in love, been rejected, gone to India, come a cropper, made a mess of things, and Richard Dalloway had a very great liking for the dear old fellow too. Millie Brush saw that, saw a depth in the brown, eye, in the brown of his eyes, saw him hesitate, consider, which interested her. As Mr. Dalloway always interested her, for what was he thinking, she wondered, about Peter Walsh? That Peter Walsh had been in love with Clarissa. That he would go back directly after lunch and find Clarissa. That he would tell her in so many words that he loved her. Yes, he would say that. And these reminiscences from 30 years ago are, are littered throughout the narrative. And through her innovative use of free and direct speech, the distinction between who is actually narrating become unclear. Now, this is a technique that Wolf excels at. Um, where the more conventional nar narrative of either first or third person becomes indistinguishable. It appears as though the character's thoughts are being reported to us, while at the same time it could also be a representation of actual speech. Wolf's narratives in inhabit the space between the first <coughs> and third person. 
Yet it's not merely the temp uh, temporality of the narrative that both Mrs. Dalloway and Ulysses have in common. They both have large passages of stream of consciousness, most notably in the final chapter to Ulysses, often referred to as Molly Bloom's soliloquy. And if you haven't read Ulysses, or like rule if you stopped after 200 pages, I urge you to read this chapter. Um, it's way too long for me to quote here. However, it is an incredible piece of writing. In literary terms, a stream of consciousness is where the narrative reflects the innermost thoughts of a character, and it replicates the thought process of a character. It gives a sense of real time in narrative. However, this is only a sense. For the act of reading the actual text on the page can never quite match up to the speed of human thought. Take this example from Mrs. Dalloway. What a lark, what a plunge. For so it always seemed to her, when, with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Burton into the open air. How fresh, how calm. Still on this, of course. The air was in the early morning, like a flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave, chill and sharp, and yet, for a girl of eighteen, as she was, solemn. Feeling as she did, standing there, at the open window, that something awful was about to happen, looking at the flowers, at the trees with the smoke winding off them, and the rooks rising, falling. Standing and looking until Peter Walsh said, musing amongst the vegetables. Was that it? I prefer men to cauliflowers. Was that it? He must have said it at breakfast one morning, when she had gone out onto the terrace. Peter Walsh, he would be back from India one of these days, June or July, she forgot which for his letters were awfully dull. It was his sayings one remembered, his eyes, his pocket knife, his smile, his grumpiness, and the million things, millions of things had utterly vanished. How strange it was. A few sayings like this about cabbages. This is a break from the traditional narrative and storytelling, and it happens on the first page. The reader is party to Clarissa's innermost thoughts as they race from the French windows to waves and flowers, through to Peter Walsh, his smile, and a few sayings like this about cabbages. Wolf and Joyce were at the forefront of an experimental literature that innovated and developed narrative techniques that had become commonplace. For example, if anyone's read Ali Smith's 2001 novel Hotel World, you, you, you'll see a lot of this in, in operation there as well. In his 2010 book About Time, Mark Curry convincingly argues that both Mrs. Dalloway and Ulysses are connected at a thematic and technical level with the opposition between internal and external time. And with the enormous quality of quantity of mind actively that fills the smallest unit of time. I think this is the essence of how stream of consciousness narrative operates, in that it is about time and the difficulty of representing the speed of thought on the page. However, the text is just that, a, a representation that cannot accurately replicate the thought process. Both Wolfe and Joyce give, inc uh, give credible approximations that remind the reader throughout of time and that they take place on one day. This is set against the opposition of the narrative being unable to accurately represent time. So, so far, <coughs> I've talked about Wolfe's relationship with modernism and how she was at the forefront of a narrative experimentalism, and how Mrs. Dalloway can be viewed as a response to Ulysses. I'd now like to look at some beginnings, and um, I've got a few openings from Chekhov, Mansfield and Wolf. The first one's from Chekhov's The Lady with the Dog. It was said that a new person had appeared on the seafront, a lady with a little dog, Dmitri Dmitris Gurov, who had then been... Who had by then been a fortnight at Yalta, and was so fairly at home there, had begun to take an interest in the new arrivals. The second one is from Mansfield's Bliss. Although Bertha Young was 30, she still had moments like this when she wanted to run instead of walk, to take dancing steps on and off the pavement, to bowl a hoop, to throw something up in the air and catch it again, or to stand still and laugh at nothing, at nothing simply. And then we have the opening from Mrs Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, for Lucy had a work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges. Ropemeyer's men were coming, and then, thought Clarissa Dalloway, what a morning, fresh as a visit to the children on the beach. 
<laughs> I've been very deliberate in my choice of writers and text here. Um, I've chosen Mrs. Dalloway from Wolf, Wolf to give this lecture more continuity by focusing on one novel alongside her diaries and a room of one's own. And in addition, as I've already mentioned, Mansfield and Wolf were friends and often read and reviewed each other's work. Both women were influenced by Russian literature, and in particular by Chekhov's short stories, which have recently been translated into English by Constance Garnett. And I think it's a symptom of the modern world and how, in the early part of the 20th century, the world began to get smaller very quickly. <coughs> Once again, the boundaries of modernism start to get blurred. As I stated earlier, the dates for modernism are fluid. The majority of Chekhov's writing not only predates the accepted dates of modernism, but was written in the 19th century. And yet any one of these op openings could have been written by him. To my mind, Chekhov is a modernist writer, and his influence over the subsequent generation of writers ca cannot be underplayed. In all three examples, the one thing that strikes me is the immediacy of the narrative, by which I mean it, it is clear from these opening sentences that there is a story that exists beyond the narrative that's presented to us, the readers. We are dropped into the middle of the action. There are no concessions made to the reader. No once upon a time, or are you sitting comfortably? This immediacy places the reader in the same position as the characters. So let's have a look at the opening sentence to Mrs. Dalloway in more detail. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. This sentence in isolation displays many characteristics of modernism while also raising some concerns that crop up repeatedly in Wolfe's work. It is open-ended. It is clear that some aspect of the narrative has already occurred, or, if you like, an aspect of the story has already happened. This beginning is not the beginning as such. Rather, it is the moment where the reader becomes complicit in the story of Mrs. Dalloway. However, at this point, Mrs. Dalloway has already said that she would buy the flowers for herself. It's worth noting that there are no quotation marks around this statement, and therefore that this first sentence is not a direct speech in the traditional sense, rather it is an example of free and direct speech at the very beginning of the novel. This opening also poses the question, why is it significant for Mrs. Dalloway to buy the flowers herself? This question becomes apparent through the lines that, I've, that follow. The character of Clarissa Dalloway is part of the 1920s London society, and as I mentioned earlier, the action of the novel takes place over one day, where Clarissa is planning and preparing for a party later that evening. Clearly her servant, Lucy, has a lot on her plate on that particular day. The other word that I find striking in this sentence is Mrs. The title of the novel is repeated in the first two words. The reader is very quickly aware of the name of the protagonist in the novel, while by using her title, Mrs., this highlights her status. Clarissa is married and is referred to, as many women are, by her husband's surname. In the introduction to the Penguin Modern Classic Edition, um, which came out in 1992, Elaine Showalter emphasises this. By her emphatic use of Mrs, Wolfe draws our attention to the way in which the central woman character is socially defined by mar her marriage and masked by her marital signature. Showalter reads the predicament of women in the early 20th century into the text, in that women are labelled according to the marital status. And if this is compared to the point I made earlier about Mr Joyce in modern fiction, then I think it's perfectly valid to suggest that in both her essay and her novel, Wolf is subtly subverting the position of the writer by drawing attention to his gender. That is to say, at the time of her writing, literature was still a predominantly male pursuit. Elaine Showalter uh, is known as a feminist critic, and indeed her book, A Literature of Their Own, um, she rejects Wolf's feminism. But like many other feminist critics, she takes a room of one's own as a starting point to develop her own feminism. Wolfe is one of a handful of female modernist writers during a time where the rights of women were in the f forefront of people's mind. To critique her feminism 50 years later and out of context seems a little misleading. <coughs> I think it's more important that Wolfe was prepared to outline her position in a room of one's own. Having talked in detail about Wolfe's narrative technique, I'd, I'd like to consider Wolfe's feminism. Wolfe's most explicitly feminist, feminist work is A Room of One's Own, which has had a proud, profound effect on women's writing and literary criticism. It originated as two papers read to women and undergraduates in Cambridge in October 1928. 
And I think it's important to remember that women had only been given the vote in 1919. The main area of Wolfe's political interest was in women's lack of a professional role. <coughs> Put simply, Wolfe's argument is that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she's to write fiction. And I believe it's one of the reasons that readers are afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, it, it's this association with feminism and the fact that uh, Woolf's name has become synonymous with feminism as well. Now, like her fiction, A Room of One's Own opens with a sense of something, something having happened outside the text. But, you may say, we asked you to speak about women in fiction. What has that got to do with A Room of One's Own? Her essay reflects the nature of her fiction. Again, we have the immediacy of the word but. And her narrative continues in a similar vein. The reader, or, or listener, is dropped into a discussion that appears to be already underway. And in a sense, it is. Rachel Bowlby addresses this in her book, Feminist Dem Destinations. Wolf's but indicates that the topic cannot be addressed from the same place of absolute innocence. A story involving women in fiction in various complicated ways, has been underway for quite some time, for the duration of a written history at least. And it would be utopian to imagine that it might be possible to discuss such a matter in abstract or ideal terms. For Bowlby, Wolf's discourse is deliberately intruding a space that is traditionally inhabited and governed by men. She plays with the expected norms and order of the lecture or essay to give a text that is unpredictable and hard to pin down. One obvious example of this is in the theoretical first-person narrative. Although it's written in the first person, and the narrator refers to themselves as I throughout, the essay reads as if there's many different eyes. Here then was I. Call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael, or by any name you please. It is not a matter of any importance. Sitting on the banks of a river a week or two ago in fine October weather, lost in thought. That colour that I've spoken of, women in fiction, the need of coming to some conclusion on a subject that raises all sorts of prejudice and pass passions, bowed my head to the ground. Throughout the work, A Room of one, One's Own retains a feeling of elusiveness as it continually shifts perspective from one to another, without really giving the reader a definitive idea of who I actually is. Now this is Elaine Showalter's objection to Wolf's text. A Room of One's Own for her does not read as if it's a personal statement from Wolf as such. The techniques of Room are like those of Wolf's fiction, particularly Orlando, which she was writing at the same time. Repetition, exaggeration, parody, whimsy and multiple viewpoint. On the other hand, despite its illusions of spontaneity and intimacy, A Room of One's Own is an extremely impersonal and defensive book. Now, I, I agree with this view of a, a room of one's own. However, I don't share Showalter's objection. I like the fact that it reads like a piece of her fiction. What I think Showalter is ignoring is the fact that it is an extension of a lecture. Thereby, it is an oral performance, something that's designed to be heard. A sort of performative criticism before anybody knew what performative criticism was. To criticise a room of one's own for being impersonal belies the sentiments that it asserts. In her book Sexual Textual Politics, Toral Moy picks up upon this. In her own textual practice, Wolf exposes the way in which language refuses to be pinned down to an underlying essential meaning. So by adopting the elusive narrative style of her fiction, Wolf is able to demonstrate the argument through the very act of writing itself, or speaking given that it was a lecture. For me, the central statement of A Room of One's Own is For we think back through our mothers if we are women. It is useless to go to the great men writers for help, however much one may go to them for pleasure. In this case, men may well be useless. Yet what is more pertinent to my discussion is that this one sentence preempts much of feminist literary criticism of the 70s and 80s. Many critics grasped Wolfe's proposition as a sort of critical calling to arms and actively sought to recover the female literary tradition for themselves. Note, I'm borrowing the plurism of Wolfe's sentence here as well. Um, her mothers, women, men, writers and them. 
For just as it seems that there are many wolves, as we read a room of one's own, then it follows there are many feminisms. A room of one's own acknowledges this and expresses this through its use of multiple narrators and voice. The implication of Wolf's assertion is that if we accept the concept of thinking back through our mothers, then it follows that for a woman to write as a woman, there needs to be an ex- examples of other women's writing, writing as women. Wolf's text continues. They, and by they she means great novelists, have based it on a sentence that was current at the time. The sentence that was current at the beginning of the 19th century ran something like this. The grandeur of their works was an argument with them, not to stop short, but to proceed. They could have no higher excitement or satisfaction than in the exercise of their art and endless generations of truth and beauty. Success prompts to exertion and habit facilitates success. That is a man's sentence. Behind it, one can see Johnson, Gibbon and the rest. It was a sentence that was unsuited for a woman to use. Now, this raises a few questions. Firstly, Is it possible to write a sentence that is a woman's sentence? Secondly, is it possible to determine the sex of a writer purely from linguistic traits? And finally, if the answer to these questions is yes, how would a reader recognise either? Many answers have been written as as a result of this passage. Indeed, much of the French feminisms of Helene Sassou, Lucie Grey and Julia Kristeva and the notion of ecature feminine or writing the body seem to take this proposition as a starting point for their own theories. The opening of Sassou's influential essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, is a good example. I shall speak about women's writing, about what it will do. Women must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing, from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies, for the same reason, by the same law, with the same fatal goal. Women must put herself into the text, as into the world and into history by her own movement. For me, this is Sassou's take on thinking back through our mothers if we are women. For her, it is essential for uh, for a woman to acknowledge the female through the act of writing, and it is necessary for women to impose themselves on the conventional masculine text. Whereas, as Sarah M. Gilbert and... Susan Gubar recognised in their book um, The Mad Woman in the Attic at the time when Wolfe was writing the women writers seemed locked into a disconcerting double bind she had to choose between admitting that she was only a woman or protesting she was as good as a man so is this Wolfe's legacy? is a room of one's own a statement of intent? I think it probably is and it has certainly been read as such by critics who have continued to engage with it, regardless of whether they accept or reject its sentiments or not. I see it as an open text that has lent itself to formulating my own viewpoint of feminism and literature. If I were to take issue with it, it would be over its somewhat naive view of some of the issues. Wolf's solution for feminism and women's writing is a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. To me, this seems a fairly materialistic perspective, for surely a woman can write without either money or a room. In the introduction to her anthology of Wolf criticism, Rachel Bowlby anticipated an impending resurgence in Wolf studies. At her time of writing in 1991, Wolf would have been dead for 50 years, thereby, thereby freeing her work from copyright restrictions and leaving her work open to be published by any number of publishers. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that this has indeed been the case with many publishers of classics producing their own editions of Wolf. And as Bowlby predicted, these new books would come furnished with all the canonical paraphernalia which they have up until now been denied or spared in the form of editors' introductions and footnotes at the back with masses of useful material for students and teachers on the many courses for which Wolf is a prescribed author. Now this is significant on two counts. Firstly, it explains the lack of accessible editions of Wolf's work prior to this point. However, the more salient point is that part of the perceived difficulty in reading Wolf before this time was the lack of more popular editions of of her work. Bowlby points out that these new editions, um, and you know, 
think Penguin, Oxford, Vintage and Wordsworth, etc. They are all introduced by leading academics and wolf experts, writing in a less academic way that is more accessible to a general or even common reader. Of course, both Bowlby herself and her anthology are part of this industrial academia. Bowlby has introduced many wolf texts for many different publishers. And similarly, in 1992, Elaine Showater introduces Mrs. Dalloway for Penguin. But by this time, her, her objections seem to have softened. And in A Room of One's Own, she specifically addresses the problems of the women novelist having to revise the language, syntax, sentence structure, literary conventions and value system of the novel created by men. Of course, this merely demonstrates Bowlby's contention, and I think it would be fair to suggest that Showalter is, is writing in a less academic way in order to fulfil her brief from the publisher and appeal to a wider audience, and thereby help to make Wolfe's text more accessible. Bowlby argues that there are two different Wolfes, the one that appears in academic criticism and the one who features in more readily accessible media. Wolf has been used as a way to think generally about women and writing, or women and language, which has also been used to discuss women and psychology, women and sexuality, women and mothering, masculinity and war, women and national identity. These are all areas that crop up throughout Wolf's oeuvre. Therefore, it's no real surprise to find that her texts have been used in order to discuss wider themes that can be read into them. I began tonight su suggesting that there is a perception that Wolf is a difficult read. Yet a quick survey of the University Library throws up hundreds of works, each one with a different take on Wolf's life and work. If anything, it appears that Wolf's writing offers itself to analysis, and as a result, readers are able to understand her work through a, vi a variety of diverse perspectives. For me, there are many wolves. She is a modernist, an innovator, a feminist, a writer. And I hope that I've managed to convey a few of these for you tonight, and at the same time, maybe even taken out some of the fear of reading Virginia Woolf. Now, just to finish off, I'm going to try a little bit of a sales pitch. As I mentioned earlier, I intend to run a couple of courses this year for the Centre of Lifelong Learning. Um, these will draw upon some of the themes that I have discussed tonight. Um, I believe the brochure comes out next month, um, and I think if you go on the website you can sign up and uh, get a copy yourself. Um, the courses that I'm doing, um, well, they're on the screen for you now. Um, starting from October, I'll be taking a course called Introduction to Modernism for 10 weeks. And it's exactly that. I'll be looking at a number of authors, um, including some that I've mentioned tonight, and I'll be encouraging people to read Ulysses. Or read a bit of Ulysses. Um, and the second course is a sort of continuation of this lecture as such. Um, and it will run from January for eight weeks and um, effectively I'm going to try and draw out more of these themes but actually look more heavily at, at, at Will's work as well. Um, and uh, that's just about everything that I've got to say tonight. So thank you very much for coming along um, and that's that. <laughs>